Music and the arts in general are the supreme way to exercise human creativity and they must be initiated as early as possible and continue until the end of one's life. This sentence, taken from an interview by Yannick Zenakis, stresses the importance he attached in the mid-70s to requesting a new pedagogy adapted to the needs inherent in his way of conserving and composing music. In his mind, this will only be possible if he can develop a new tool capable of reducing cultural barriers related to learning music. Xenakis also wants to allow as many people as possible, all of all ages and backgrounds, to access musical composition while deeply reintegrating music as a social activity. Also, it is important to remember that Yannick Zenakis had, since the 50s, the intuition to develop a machine that would allow him to bypass traditional music notation and streamline the exploration of this new way of composing. According to his vision, such an instrument would facilitate, for example, sorry, yeah, that's it, the graphic transcription of Glissandi in his work Metastasis, but it was only in 1977 that the prototype of such a machine hybridizing drawing, sound synthesis, and music emerged in the research center front by Zenakis, the CEMAMU, Centre d'études en mathématiques automatiques musicales. It is called UPIC, Unité Polyagogique Informatique du CEMAMU. The software, which was developed in great part by Guimédig. The agogic suffix evoke, in addition to all parameters specific to the expressiveness of music notation, opening the field of perceptive notion of the compositional process, graphically incorporating musical structure, sound dynamics envelope, making drawing the main vector of music composition. Since his first vision, with a large graphic table, an electromagnetic pen, and a computer interface, you pick as enabling composers to visually design all the elements of her is opus, from a sound's microphone to the macro structure of the work, combining in a single machine both formal design and sound synthesis. Thus, the first fully functional UPIC station was born within the CIMAMU, which developed its design between 1968 and 2001. This research also led to subsequent version of the UPIC to achieve a PC version in 1991 and a software version in 2001. In order to promote this invention, the CEMAMU made several trips between 1980 and 85 to introduce the system in cultural centers in France and around the world, each comprising one or two week session. The first interaction between the UPIC and the general public took place in 80 when the city of Lille and IRM, l'Atelier Régional de Musique, directed by Alain Desprez, welcomed the CMMU research team and the machine. For this event, five groups of young children, dancer, computer specialists, were each set to task to compose a short piece on the machine. But I'm going to let Alain Desprez develop this period. He leaves his close up. In 1985, the music department of the French Ministry of Culture under the auspice of Maurice Fleury, a dedicated advocate of Yanis Zenakis, decides with the composer to create a new non-profit association, Les Ateliers UPIC, where Alain Desprez, appointed director, <laughs> will be responsible for the systematic presentation, promotion, and initiation of very public to the UPIC. The composer, François Bernard Mach, a longtime friend of Yannick Zenakis, is in turn nominated president of the association as he was one of the first to invest in the promotion of this system. The same year, Marsh, then professor at the University of Strasbourg, created with the help of his colleague Otto Schneider, the Primus, Polyèdre de Recherche en Informatique Musicale, which hosted one of the first academic programs in France to become a sound technician, German equivalent of Tollmeister and where electroacoustic composition, including the UPIC, was taught. 
perhaps uh, François Bernard Mach will share some of his experience from uh, this time with us. Beginning in uh, 87, Yanis Zenakis called on Les Ateliers UP to develop in parallel with his, with his promotional trips a studio activity, production of works, as well as a regular pedagogical offering. Two such composition studio opened their doors in April 80, 80, 87 at the Parc de, la Vite, Parc de la Villette in Paris. The vitality of the center is so great that in 87 alone, Les Ateliers Hupic welcomed many composers with aesthetic reasons as diverse as Pierre Bernard, François Bernard Mach, Jim Harley, Peter Nelson, Julio Estrada, Jean-Claude Eloy, and Alain Lito. Their musical production around the Hupic led to a whole series of concerts in Europe, Mexico, Canada, and the United States. In the 90s, the UPIC system fascinated a whole new generation of composers, such as Brigitte Robin Doré, Takeito Chimatsu, Nicolas Cisternino, Gerard Pape, and many others. The real time version is now fully visible. A screen and a mouse gradually replaced the drawing table and the magnetic pen. Since 1991, the UPIC operates on Windows. On a PC. Although these technological developments have changed the handling of the, um, the handling of the UPIC compared to its original system, according to Gerard Pape, the last official director to date, it is not at all removed from the primary pedagogical intuition of Yannick Zenakis. In 2000, and on the initiative of Gerard Pape, his atelier UPIC were renamed the Centre de Création Musicale Yanis Zenakis, CCMIX. Indeed, the association extended its mission to pedagogy and composition in the broadest sense by developing a musical research program combining science, mathematics, and electroacoustics, a musical composition activity, and several teaching programs, of which UPIC is no longer the sole focal center. By engaging the center in this direction, Gerard Pape reveals that, in addition to the interest and curiosity aroused by the discovery of the machine, the UPIC and the tools associated with it are possible vectors, among other media, for musical composition. But for, Gena, for Gerard Pape, the UPIC is an engine of individual creativity, enabled to suggest a sum of standardized proposals but which, by its flexibility of use, fully reveals the creative potential of its users. In 2007, in response to an audit carried out by the French Ministry of Culture, the former CCMX team was replaced by a new team whose mission is to, I quote, redefine the objectives of the association focusing on the preservation, enhancement, and dissemination of the intellectual heritage of Yannick Zinakis' works. Indeed, since the death of, the, of its founder, it seemed more appropriate for the new team to rename again the association simply the Centre Yannick Zinakis VI. So, after having developed these few historical landmarks, I will now highlight through the example of François Bernard Mach and the Ximé in Athens, the influence of UPIC in the musical sphere. So in order to illustrate the multiple ways of composing with the UPIC, I have chosen to sketch out the compositional approach of François Bernard Mach, who I hope uh, will speak about it itself at this symposium. By François Bernard Mach himself, it was undoubtedly the strong writing that about him to Xenakis that spontaneously led him to come and meet this new kind of machine. According to the composer, to the composer's archives, he was one of the very first to welcome the return of the UPIC to France after the creation of the Polytope de Mycène in October 1978. In addition to his composition using the UPIC, the first of which dates from the very early 80s, François Bernard Mach was very early on involved in the development of the system of composition through drawing. As soon as the system was discovered, François Bernard Mach proposed a broad use 
even diverting from the initial principle proposed by Xenakis. While Xenakis used the UPIC as a means of facilitating musical modeling by sound synthesis or martial mathematical, physical, statical laws, François Bernard Mach confides in an interview with Bruno Serrou to use it upside down, utilisé à l'envers. He is essentially interested in one of the alternative possibilities of the prototypes, the sampler. The first example of this approach is the creation of his Proteus, opus uh, 42, the third of the Quatre Phonographies de l'eau, a series of tape pieces mirrored in a thematic exhibition of water in Villeneuve-les-Avignon in July 1980. François Benramach abandons for this opus the synthesis capacities of the UPIC in favor of its graphic and dating possibilities. As it interests to me in an interview, the possibility of visually designing the arrangement of sounds on the graphic table allowed him to refine the rhythmic editing of the raw sounds in a much more precise way rather than by more or less randomly editing them on tape. The UPIC synthesis capacities were only to be exploited with his second works composed using this, uh, this, the, using the UPIC. In Imperion, on plus 43, composed in the wake of Proteus and premiered in June 81 in Paris, one can hear, for example, a bridge sounds oscillating between synthesis and a natural model. One of Imperion's first sound claims to be based on the technique of mixing the recording of a percussion instrument with synthetic envelopes. So let's hear the first sound of Imperion. Sorry for the cut. This aesthetic, which could be described as a sound anamorphosis, is based on a process that François Bernard Mach admits to using only rarely. When he says, I avoid manipulating sound too clearly. Because if I adopt them, it's because I already hear the music as it is. But sometimes I start from a sound material that I have made totally unrecognizable. Thus, based on animal recordings, I made sounds on the UP graphic table that only I know the animal origin of. More precisely, the sounds of birds and amphibians used in the last part of Hyperion are recombined with synthetic sound and become difficult to recognize, not only for aesthetic reasons, but also because they are part of a broader structural game. As the composer explains in Imperion's program note for a concert given at the University of California, San Diego in 1988, I quote, the third part is a game where the rhythmic cells are superimposed on different tempi and with different timbres. Microstructures are often identical to macrostructures. Quantitative change in duration scales and pitch variation seems to appear to the auditor as qualitative change. A related process will also be used when it exploits with the UPIC's ability to generate complex waveforms, in particular in Titon, created for the Lille Festival in October 1989. After extracting a rhythmic envelope from the recording of an insect sound, the composer synthesizes it and stretch it temporarily like a sound microscope to such an extent that this sound alone generates the shape of the entire work. Yet, 
from this distant envelope emerge the quintessence of this sound which, through his very inaudible beats, will give rise to a whole set of subtle variation, what François Bernard Mach calls a second rhythmic level. Remanence of this process, the raw sound of the insect is seated at the end of the walk as a phenotype concordant, or more broadly, as a distant echo of the myth of Titan, who was metamorphosed in a Cicadia. Because for the composers, if, myth, if mythology proposes animals and as intercessors toward spirituality, it is because they are, is, there is indeed something fundamental in the sounds used by the animal. When these human musics are lost in arbitrary structures, we lose sight of this anchoring. It is necessary to achieve a kind of harmony between the solicitation of nature and structure. In parallel, in parallel with the UPIX developments in Paris, Yannick Zenakis founded a research center for contemporary music, the CIME, in collaboration with John J. Popaoyanu, musicologist, and Stefanos Vassiliadis, a composer, in Athens in 1979. As the recently published CIME archives show, Yannick Zenakis and John J. Papaoyanu had been in an epistolary relationship since the 50s, and more precisely, the, the musicologist Nikos Joachim points out that he has al always been a friend and supporter of Yannick Zenakis since they met in 1955 for the creation of Metastasis in Donaueschingen. Since its creation, the CIME has set itself the objective of developing bridge between the arts and science, stimulating creativity, research, and artistic education. If in, 19, uh, in, if in um, 85 in Paris, Yannick Zenakis created the UPIC workshop, in Athens, the CIME occurred an UPIC in 86. Stefanos Vassiliadis was appointed director of CIME from its foundation until 2004. From the beginning, composers Aris Xantoudakis and Dimitri Kamarotos have been involved in the center educational and musical research activity. The educational programs began immediately after the creation of the CIME. Courses on electroacoustic music were given and students were able to work on the UPIC. This UPIC session were open to both experienced composers and students. The fruits of this work led the CIME to co-produce with the French Institute of Athens an important festival in which many Greek composers presented their works composed on the UPIC. This festival still exists and the six presented in 2015 an interactive exhibition dedicated to UPIC. Since January 2015, the six and CIME have been planning to create a common library of digital archives related to UPIC. And while a large number of Greek composers came to compose on the Athens UPIC, the work conducted jointly with the six and the CIME made it possible, for example, to isolate the trajectory of Ivan Patashish. This composer visited the two centers and composed works overlapping in Athens and Paris UPIC. Ivan Patashish is an Hungarian composer, pioneer of electroacoustic music in Hungary. He founded the Exastud Studio in Budapest in 1971. His works have won numerous international awards and he traveled extensively and composed at Columbia University, New York, Stockholm, Bourges, and Paris. According to Costas Manzoros, composer and researcher currently in charge of the Ximer archives, Ivan Patashich began producing his UPIC piece, Musique Dessinée, at the Ximer in Athens in July 1987, and then had it broadcast in Budapest by Hungarian Radio. However, it appeared that the container of the Athens magnetic tapes was empty. A year later, in 98, it seems that Ivan Patashish continued his research on the UPIC, but this time on the one in Paris. 
The six archives show a copy of the Music Dessinée with the following inscription on the container made in Athens using the UPIC system. So listen to Music Dessinée. the time so <laughs> I cut. In 1988, Ivan Patashish composed a second piece for UPIC, Chanson Nocturne du Poisson, at the Atelier UPIC in Paris. It was while searching for this reference that we noticed that the six archives contained a copy of both of, the, of these works for UPIC. It should also be noted, according to John J. Popariano, that Ivan Patashish met the composer Takis Velinatis at the Ksime in Athens, who was familiar with the UPIC system. Velinatis has, had already composed two works for UPIC, Croae and Emilia. According to John J. Papayanu, the two composers collaborated in 1987 to compose music dessinée in Athens. The discovery of the trajectory of this Hungarian composer was made possible by the valorization action carried out around the six archives since 2011. Seven years ago, I came here to the CAN for a symposium to discuss the richness of this collection with the heterogeneous, heterogeneous contents, but I also had many questions about the library treatment. Now, I'm very pleased to come back here with some answers. The six collections contain a wide range of media. This reflect the activity of the Music Creation Center, where more than 130 composers have come to work since 985. The six collections are enriched by the welcome of a new legacies from Xenaki's collaborators, musicologists or photographers. Recently, Marie-Hélène Serra, who worked on the source code on the UPIC and on the develop development of Gendi at Semamu, has contributed her notes and archives. Let us also mention to the Maurice collection uh, photos, LPs, recordings of conferences given by Xenakis, the Dick Lucas collection, documentation on the construction of the P Philips Pavilion in 1958 in Brussels during its reconstruction in Eindhoven in the 80s. A tribute to the Robert Dupuis, Robert Dupuis collection on Polytop to Cluny, and finally to the photographic archives by, of any loner, many photographs of uh, Xenakis and other composers. And finally, Bruno Rastuan's complete photo documentation on the diatop in both Paris and Bonn. To better measure the, this diversity, I will quickly detail the content of the archives. 11 linear meters of paper archives that contains later emails, course notes, research notes, draft, hardware and software documentation, newspaper clipping, concert program, typescript and manuscript, thesis. The collection of large format posters has been digitized as a matter of urgency given the fragility of the media. Technical constraint led to the six to involve an external service provider for this operation, 
Arcanum, a company specializing in the digitization of fragile paper and iconographic objects. The cataloging of this collection has been complete and the entire digitized collection is online on the SIX website. The center has 450 scores, more of which are unpublished. At the current state of research, it can be suggested that most of them come from the course of, for candidates for the music composition courses that the center was organizing. Only a few of them, in particular the graphic scores, and of course, the scores of composers in residence were written specifically within the Saint itself. A multimedia, 3,500 items, accounts for half of the archival collection. Audio documents constitute the majority of them, excluding vinyl records, LPs, cassette, and published compact disc CDs, which certainly represented the center music library. Other sources, such as the 80s, magnetic tapes, and burned CDs, are all unpublished documents. It is therefore a unique collection that includes both live recording, sound banks used by electroacoustic composers, and probably unpublished complete works. The continued digitization, cataloging, and indexing of these documents will certainly tell us more. These documents have all been digitized for conservation purpose, mostly by Daniel Tage, a member of the SIX for the CDs, burn CDs and DAT, or by Les Musiques de la Boulangère for magnetic tapes. Most of the burn CDs, whose durability is more than uncertain, have been successfully digitized. Only five of the 1,130 uh, discs in this collection are no longer readable. This media, widely used by composers for backup purposes since the mid-90s, were used to record both sound, te sound, text, video, or computer files, but rarely music alone. The heterogeneity of this content complicates cat cataloging efforts, but constitutes a source of information of primary importance to inform the creative process of works. All of 174 DATs have been successfully digitized. Most of them are audio backup files, but some may include sound object banks used to compose works. Other DATs are backup copy of the initial version of the works, rarely the masters or concert recording. All of the 120 magnetic tapes were all successfully digitized, except for two each, uh, the two two to each tape, tapes, <laughs> sorry. The only posting of audio file extract is employed by awaiting authorization from untitled owners of right. However, cataloging and online records in this collection are complete. Each catalog entry includes a photograph of the box to encourage crowdsourcing. Writing is sometimes, sometimes eligible or the information is not sufficient to precisely catalog the sound file. By doing so, we can also re rely on user feedback to complete our catalog and tries. In general, the filling, inventory, and digitization of all unpublished audio documents has been completed. The SIX is currently beginning the process of finding the rightful owners for the posting of audio excerpt on the website. Iconographic sources as a play an important role. Photographs, for example, often reveal a certain, a certain documentary appeal, such as portraits of composers in action or even a few concert shorts. Not two main legacies. The collections of photographer Bruno Rastoin, whose image focus on Diatop and UPIX workshop. The any loaner phones which uh, include many portraits of composers, including Yannick Zenakis and Karla Stockhausen. Please note, these two collections are under Creative Commons licenses to facilitate their circulation while, protect while protecting copyright. Since 2012, SIX has set up a website using a free and open CMS 
that display proof of the 40 linear meters of its digital archives and the associated metadata in Dublin Core. The Dublin Core is a set of metadata that include 15 standard fields, all of which are repeatable and optional. Although the Dublin Core does not have a fine granularity of data description, it ensures maximum interoperability of data from one system to another and requires limited library and technical knowledge. In addition, the Omeka allow, allows you to add um, as many custom fields as you wish to a second set of metadata. These possibilities make it possible to describe the six collection by adapting to the heterogeneity of the media. The 2,500 records of the inventory under FindMaker are entered in the CMS. 990 digitized documents and that records in Dublin Core are in public mode and can be viewed online on the site. The general inventory of the six archives is published as a PDF file. And for example, the online publication of this archive made it possible to help Victoria Simon then a doctoral, doc, a doctoral student at McGill University, and now a confirmed PhD teaching in California, in her work on sound design interfaces through drawing. She was thus able to organize a research trip to Europe and work on the sixth collection in Rouen for five weeks. In addition to reporting archives in search, engine, search engines, Omeka allows the creation of virtual exhibitions the possibility of adding comments and even crowdsourcing possibilities. Since 2012, a traveling exhibition published by SIX has been on display. Available in French and English, it traces the history of the UPIC using documents from the archives of the Centre Yannick Zenakis, correspondence, concert posters, photographs, video testimonies, highlights the experience of composer of the many educational workshops conducted with children or blind people with a UPIC. Six, uh, 2015, a web editorialization of the exhibition has been carried out by Aurélien Deco and myself to extend, extend the experience. So take a look. The virtual exhibit makes a link with the catalog and digitized collection of the Centre Yannick Zenakis. Visitors are invited to discover new archives that are highlighted as part of this project, but also to continue their research with the help of the online catalog. Yeah. One of the next projects of the six is to create, is to create open archives repositories uh, like OIPMH, Open Archive Initiative Protocol, Protocol Metadata Vesting. The idea would be to create a common archives warehouse with the XIME. The contemporary music portal is already harvesting the digital archives of the six via this protocol. 
in addition, since February 2018, the six Omeka website has been hosted by Humanum, the CNRS, Centre National de Recherche Scientifique, TGIR for D Digital Humanities. Very soon, the six data will be exposed and reported in Isidore, a federated research journal of the CNRS. Merci pour votre attention. Is this on? Yes. Thank you, Cyril. It's, uh, it's, it, we've come a long way, baby, from <laughs> when, we, when we started, uh, when we inherited uh, the situation in 2007. So it's been over mm. 10 years now mm -mm. that we actually started thinking about it. But there were a few years where we were just trying to figure out um, what we had, had inherited. Um, one thing. Uh, thing that I would like to say is when you were giving the typology of our archives, this dates from before uh, new legacies coming in. We've, as uh, Cyril mentioned, there have been significant uh, gifts donated to the Sikhs <clears throat> by former Zanakis collaborators, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing to see the outpouring of, of generosity on the one hand, but al also the amount of work, because like Marie-Hélène Serra's fa uh, fond is how many boxes, and this, it, it, it would take a year to get the cataloging done and to get everything up, up to date. But it is good to know that it didn't go into the garbage can and that we will get to this at some point because there's an incredible amount of material there for, for future research. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you for your presentation and, and the work you've carried out is, um, is, is um, really um, amazing. Uh, just wondering, uh, the focus is on the web. Um, are there other ways to, um, to sort of uh, disseminate uh, the archive that you've considered? Either like a yeah. Like With this protocol, est-ce que tu peux traduire okay. sur la dissémination des archives? Um, on va intégrer euh, le moteur de recherche fédéré Isidor, pour l'instant qui est franco-français. For the moment, we've integrated um, meta moteur, a metadata, a meta metadata base uh, called Isidor, which is for the moment restricted to France, but whose whose intention is to go global. Il faut bien comprendre que c'est une très grande infrastructure de recherche qui fédère l'ensemble des données des, de la recherche en sciences humaines et sociales. It's uh, part of, is it part of Humanum? Mm. It's part of the, hum, uh, Humanum is, is the code name for this uh, digital humanities thing in, in France. So it's all um, social sciences, uh, metadata that will be worldwide. So already we have our foot in the door into the French um, portal of that, and that will Mais go techniquement, in. on est capable d'intégrer le WorldCat. And, and technically, we're, we can integrate the WorldCat today. And probably, I've, I think I've even seen that there have been some things that have been referenced, for example, through the CDMC, because we're also part of uh, the Contemporary Music Portal in France, which is run by the SESM and, and, and uh, the Documentation Center for Contemporary Music. And they are part of WorldCat, and so anything that they've taken from us I've seen some of our archives on La dissémination en fait est aussi facilitée par euh, l'ajout de, de licences Creative Commons directement négociées avec euh, les donateurs. Yeah. This is this is really important too is is getting the Creative Commons agreements from all of the uh, the donors or 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 people the um, heirs or whatever uh, to do this and and you can't really do much with it except for research in our archives until you have that Creative Commons. Once you have the Creative Commons, then, it can, then you can diffuse it easily. Do you have other ideas about how we can disseminate? <laughs> just, 
just probably through concerts really and, and things like that but it's it's I've, I've been involved a little bit with the Delia Derbyshire archive for in the, at the University of Manchester and and one of the problems that they have is the copyright issue mm -hmm. you know because it's not clear who owns what and I think that I can see that might be some issues with with, with this as well with your own um, via your own archive in a way but uh, I'll let you know if there's anything you know I, th I think introducing these works to a broader uh, audience or you know, or or different avenues to look at. I think that's, that's something that um, is always, always uh, interesting. Yeah. Great. Also, it's true that um, are you are you online? Can you get online? Yeah, this Can one. You see that we are on the campus because we are housed by the University of Rouen now in Normandy, and uh, there we've regularly hold lectures there. We started a series, Lundi's and Aki's Monday, first and then it became Mercredi, and now it's just, what do we call it now? It's Aujourd'hui's and Aki's, today's and Aki's, because we kept changing the, 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 the series title. Um, so we, we regularly hold either concerts or lectures there, uh, and also the University of Rouen has a program called the UTLC, Université de toutes les cultures, which is kind of an ongoing university, open to the public, very, very um, sort of general public. And uh, we generally host two to three of their maybe 10 uh, conferences every year there also. But part of the Aujourd'hui Zanakis series is certainly concerts. Um, and that, as long as like Brigitte Robin Doré or, or Richard Barrett or other people who, whose pieces we have in our archives, we know them and so we can get in touch with them saying, are you okay with this? And of course, they, I've never had anybody say no. Um, so this is, this is something that Rodolphe has been taking care of. Uh, for the recording, could you? Wait. Uh, have you thought about the idea of uh, composer in residences? Composing residents with uh, using the source material or anything like that. Uh, as yeah. we would love to, but we don't have the infrastructure at this point. I mean, if if we get some um, real funding, because now it's really project by project, crumb by crumb, crumb that we can survive. And most of us are working uh, for free on a on a benevolent basis. Um, we would love to, of course. And Rodolphe, with his talk and, and what he's developing also um, in terms of UPIC itself and iterations today, there's obviously just such rich material there to, to be able to do something like that. But, you know, in France, um, support for institutions like ours is horrible, is really horrible. Um, and they say, for example, the, the, the Ministry of Culture will say, well, you're at the university, let the university, you know, Be pay careful, for this. recording. And, and, you know, the university is giving us a lot already. You know, we don't have to pay rent. We have, we have good conservation for our archives. We have uh, offices. We have photocopy machines. We have, you know, this sort of thing. And then they say, well, they should hire somebody for you. Well, they, they've given us a lot. And if you balance it out, you know, and, and we'll get two or 3,000 euros for a very specific project and they'll wipe their hands. A very interesting thing, not that I want to cry, but I do want to cry. Um, we, on developing the UP sketch recently, we just had a stunning, in, in the worst sense of the word, uh, experience. We received what, 4,000 euros, I think, for the UP sketch development last year for, from the ministry, right? And then we developed this, but the, it also was part of interface and, and with a bigger budget, thanks to, to our interface partners and, and the European project. And so we, we showed it to them. They were extremely excited. Oh, this is great. Oh, and, and now Normandy wants to become sort of Silicon Valley. Of, of, some of the politicians have this pretension of making Normandy Silicon Valley. So anything digital, they get very excited about. So the ministry called us up and said, we've got a great idea. You should apply for this program, right? And so we apply, applied for the, that program. We got the grant, and the ministry said, now we don't have to give you any money. They just transferred it, you know, what they would have given us. Now they saved money because 
another department's paying for it. So we were thinking, great, you know, we're going to have twice the budget and we can really, you know, make progress on a normal pace rather than a snail's pace. And no, you know, what they give in one hand, they take away from the other. Vive la France. Oui. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Rodolphe. Um, Cyril. <laughs> my boys, my boys. Thank you.